We talk about the civil war, but we seem to ignore the fact that it was the manipulation of ethno-religious sentiment that eventually boiled over into that tragedy. I think this is a negative part of what we are experiencing. No shooting anymore. We must come together as Nigerians. We are brothers and sisters. Nigeria first before your politics. We are all engaged in trying to keep the country united. For a nation to develop, conflicts must be minimized. Peace and stability is extremely important for my hope and prayer is that the Nigerian of our dream will be achieved. A very good day to you and welcome once again to Building the Nation on Global TV, Star Times Channel 276. My name is Kemi uh, Shekul. If Nigeria is going to be a bigger, better and a more favorable country for all Nigerians, then all Nigerians must put hands on death to build this nation. And that's why we bring you the program, Building the Nation on Global TV, Star Times Channel 276. We look at various and different aspects of how we can build the nation Nigeria. Today on Building the Nation, we'll be looking at the legislature and their contribution to the next dispensation of the incoming government. Uh, we'll, what would their support or opposition portend for the incoming government? Uh, we will also be looking at the representation of women, you know, within these uh, top six positions that come with the political terrain in Nigeria. All of this and many more will be discussed with Professor Fatai. Aremu, who is a professor of governance institutions and development studies, a multi uh, author, a researcher for excellence, and a resource person for politicians and, of course, in politics across the world. We'll be right back after this break to stay with us. Hello, Nigerians. My name is Uyi Agmofwegbe, and this is Global TV. We are here to redefine the broadcast space with incisive conversations, in depth analysis, and balanced reportage. Do stay here. Hello everyone, my name is Kike Lomo Okeri. Keep watching Global TV on Star Time Channel 276. Hello Nigeria, Senior Gumena Alame is my name, and you are on to Global Television. For the very best in entertainment, sports, in-depth analysis, reportage, whatsoever that has to do with broadcasting, is so it should be. Stay cool. This is Global TV, and you're watching us on Channel 276, Star Time. My name is Jose Agokuman. Don't go anywhere. Keep watching. Welcome back. You're watching Building the Nation on Global TV, Star Times Channel 276. My name is Kemi Asheko. And like I did say before that break, uh, we will be speaking with a professor of governance institutions and development studies and a personal professor of a type, A very good day to you, Prof. Thank you for having me. And it's good to um, you know see you today. Um, the elections have come and gone. And now... The executive, at least the president-elect is in place, vice president-elect is in place. But the legislature are now at the point where they get to pick their leadership. Of what importance is the leadership of the legislature to our democracy, especially in this dispensation in our democracy? Well, thank you very much for having me. I think um, that's a very important question. But to uh, get where the question is actually coming from, we have to put everything in context. And that is to say that we need to understand what the legislature is and their role in the governance ecosystem. So if you check the constitution, you will realize that the legislature came before the executive in order of hierarchy, meaning that as the representatives of the people and being that they are the largest concentration people elected from the whole country, from all parts of the country. So the constitution vested in them a lot of powers. Powers over the finances of the federation, powers over how the money will be allocated, and powers over how to hold the people spending the money accountable. By that we mean power over appropriation, power over lawmaking, and power over, over the conduct of oversight. Because of these powers, it is expected that when it comes to the leadership of that institution, 
a lot of politics will be uh, brought to bear on it. And that is what we have been experiencing so far. Having mentioned what their role is, let's take a look at the leadership. Um, it is said that um, the ruling party, you know, usually picks who becomes the leaders of the house, especially with the fact that right now the ruling party has quite um, a number of um, representatives, you know, higher than all the other opposition parties. However, um, in picking the leadership, what are the important things to look out for, both for Senate President and Speaker, uh, Deputy Senate President and Deputy Speaker? So, um, in the first place, you see, many people really don't understand how the legislature works. And the moment you are elected into the legislature, you are entitled and you are eligible for any position in the legislature. But by convention, it is expected that those who have been there for a reasonable period of time, who understand legislative procedures, the rules and procedures of the House, will be the one to lead. Because if you are a new member and you are saddled with the responsibility of leadership and you have not understood the integrity, the complexity of the House, the chances are that the House will run into crisis. That does not mean that that's the way it has always been. Because otherwise, in 1999, from 1999 to 2003, the set of leadership that we've had, they never had any experience in the legislature before. So, but having said that, in choosing the leadership, certain principles are supposed to have been clearly stated by the political parties, and that's where they used to get it wrong. Because one of the principles is the principle of representativeness. You want the leadership of the legislature to spread across the Federation, balancing it with the major positions in the executive. In other words, we now have the president from Southwest and we have the vice president from Northeast. Then it means that we have four other regions that should jostle for the leadership of both houses. Of the six geopolitical of this, I mean, once we say that the president is already from the Southwest, and the vice president is from the northeast. Yes. It means those two regions will, two. will may not have to contend for the leadership if you have to put in principle the principle of representativeness, inclusion, and fairness. It means that the four regions that are not yet represented in the leadership, in the executive, will be the one to jostle. Then the political parties are supposed to come out clearly with the principles that will guide eligibility criteria for each of these leadership positions so that even those who are not in ambition from the beginning will already know that based on these criteria, eligibility criteria, they will be able to judge themselves whether they are even supposed to indicate interest. And if they want to indicate interest, they will know which of the positions is open to their region. So the issue is that most of the time the political parties will delay in defining those eligibility criteria and the principles that will guide the recruitment of the leadership of the National Assembly, thereby opening it for different things to come in. Well, interestingly, the political party that is ruling right now, um, uh, about a few days ago, made their position known. Based on only the region, the geopolitical zones, they also made it known clearly with names of who they are supporting. And if we take a look at the rundown of what the political party, the APC now speaking of, you know, said, they said, okay, South South to the Senate President, and they did choose Senator um, Akwabi. And then the Deputy Senate President will be going to Northwest, which is Senator Barrow Gibrain from Kano. And then the Speakership will be going to Kaduna, which is Honorable Tajidi in Abbas. Uh, and then the last side will be going to the southeast, which is Honorable Ben Kam. Now, with all of this being made known, what are the chances of some of those who have worked hard, so to speak? I want to quickly take a look at the case of the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, who's going in for his fifth term, you know, and as a matter of fact, has been a part of the party that the current president elect is from. And it doesn't appear that. The party in itself, right, is taking all of this into cognizance, including his faithfulness to the outgoing speaker. What does this portend for the House, considering that 
when he did contest as deputy speaker, he did have 358 votes out of 360. So, um, you see, it, it seems as if uh, history is about to repeat itself. Okay. And I think... Which uh, of the history? Good history, bad history? History from which side of the divide and which year? Well, it depends on whether uh, the way one sees it, whether you see it as being um, good or bad. But it will appear that the political parties have not learned the lessons from the past. In the sense that the moment you um, demonstrate some indecision, and some inconsistencies in the leadership recruitment process of the legislature, it spirals out of control very easily. And it is particularly so this time because the legislature, the National Assembly, is more plural, it's more pluralized, it's more, um, it's composed of different political parties. And the opposition party have seats combined that could actually hold the ruling party to ransom. And in the selection of leadership, we have to always bear in mind that if the, if the opposition parties could rally themselves and rally behind some aggrieved members of APC, they could actually obtain the preferences of the party. Mm. And that's why one has to be very uh, careful the way you go about it. First, one of the lessons that they appear to have missed out is the delay in laying out the eligibility criteria for each of the positions from beginning and allow every member to know. Make it public. The second thing is that you've allowed people to indicate interest, to mobilize and campaign. And then when you decide, when you now reach the point that you want to zone, we are not only zoning to a particular region, we have indicated interest in particular candidates, which is not a bad idea, because in choosing the leadership of the National Assembly, the president should be mindful of who he feels will be able to champion the agenda of the party and the agenda of the ticket together. So there is the limit, there is a limit to how you can make it random and make it open. But the moment again that you begin to define and express preference to specific candidates, you multiply grievances within the party. And a, a house that is cracked is very easy for the lizards to enter. The house is divided against itself. Yeah, that's the problem. That, uh, so we don't know the kind of negotiation and bargaining that will now uh, follow the declaration of the zoning formula. Mm -hmm. Unless the bargaining and the uh, negotiations and the coordination is very effective, you are likely to see history repeating itself. And by that, I mean the coalition of opposition members elect who rally around some aggrieved members of APC and obtain the preferences of the party. Hmm. Okay. Uh, well, you're watching Building the Nation on Global TV, Star Times Channel 276. We're looking at the legislature and how their support or the choice of their leadership would affect the incoming government of the APC and the president-elect and his vice. Uh, thus far, we have looked at the zoning of the party and their stand on this. I think that in building the nation, we must not eschew the place of women in, particip in participating in politics and also in being given some leadership roles, you know, to help and assist uh, fellow women to also achieve a lot in politics. We'll take a quick break and when we do come back, we'll look at the legislature and the fact that this 10th assembly has the least number of women uh, since 1999 that we have started this democracy. And even in the leadership of the first six people in the country as we speak, no woman sadly is represented. Hello Nigerians, my name is Uyi Agmofwegwe and this is Global TV. We are here to redefine the broadcast space with incisive conversations, in-depth analysis and balanced reportage. Do stay here. Hello everyone, my name is Kike Lomo Okeri. Keep watching Global TV on Star Time Channel 276. Hello Nigerians, my name is Global Television. You are on to Global Television. For the very best in entertainment, sports, in-depth analysis, reportage, whatsoever that has to do with broadcasting, is very should be Stay cool. This is Global TV, and you're watching us on Channel 276, Star Time.
My name is Hosea Lukman. Don't go anywhere. Watch it. Welcome back to Watch It Build in the Nation on Global TV, Channel 276 Star Times. My name is Kami Ashwekun. I've been speaking with Professor Fataya Remu, a professor of governance, institutions, and development studies, extremely passionate about Nigeria and building the capacity of the legislature in Nigeria. We're taking a look at the 10th Assembly, the leadership, how their support or opposition to the executive will affect the incoming government. Thus far, we've looked at the leadership positions, but right now it's time to take a look at the other angle, which is the representation of women in the National Assembly. Uh, Prof, in the, um, in the outgoing um, Ninth Assembly, there were quite a number of women senators, quite a number of House of Representatives. Uh, in this Tenth Assembly, the number of both houses right, have reduced considerably, especially in the Senate. But well, besides the Senate, even the National Assembly, um, the House of Rep has a reduced number of women representation. In the Ninth Assembly, there was a bill for special representation for women, and it was thrown out. But now in this Tenth Assembly, right, with the few women they were able to make it into the House of Representatives and the Senate, right, the position by the ruling party for deputy speakership was zoned to the Southeast, and yet there is a woman who's from the Southeast who is interested in that position, the person of the right honorable Miriam Onwoha, but then it was given to another man. Uh, while I'm not a feminist, I feel that it is not outrightly fair, you know, or balanced to have the first number six political positions in our country zoned to, uh, or, 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 or made open for only men. Um, I don't know, do we have to go back to the special representation for women? Or what do you think about this? And what does this portend for women in politics, really? So, well, I think for the purpose of our uh, uh, viewers back home, there are certain things that we need to really unpack. And in, in the question, we have to put it, we have to follow it layer by layer. First is the reduced number of women in the National Assembly, in the 10th Assembly. And the second one is the lack of uh, uh, a clear provision for women representation in the leadership structure. And I will refer to these two as an anticlimax, in the sense that there is no, you don't have to be a feminist. You don't even have to be a women's rights advocate before you will know that Nigeria is not doing well in terms of women's representation. And Apart from it not being fair, it is not dignifying. It doesn't present Nigeria in a good light because the whole world is moving towards women's political and economic empowerment. Nigeria is facing the opposite direction with full speed. So we can't raise our heads up high in the Committee of Nations as being a, a country that is conscious of inclusion. It's, it's, not a good uh, thing for Nigeria. It's like anti-progress. If, if, even in the Ninth Assembly, the number of women representation in the parliament was not high. To not have even lower representation is an anti-climax. And the gender bill that was introduced and that happened not to see the light of day was a huge disappointment in the sense that if you look at the content of the bill, it was actually watered down because of a lot of negotiations and bargaining. But at the end of the day, it still fails to pass. And we were looking forward to the 10th Assembly to be the one to continue where the 9th Assembly stopped. With the reduced number of women parliamentarians, where is the hope? And unless Given Nigeria and our special situation, unless you put in place appropriate legal and institutional mechanisms to create space for women to exhibit their leadership credentials, it won't happen by magic. And now when the opportunity came, this now takes me to the leadership composition. It's a unique opportunity to make a statement, to say that, okay, well, we have reduced the number of women in parliament now, but we recognize that they have a role to play. And this particular position that is zoned to the southeast will equally be zoned to the women, to the women. And or then to we can the only woman. Or to the only woman from who happened to have indicated interest in the race. And that would have been an automatic slot for her. 
it is not a question of weather. We have no choice because the whole world have moved beyond all these, uh, okay, did we stop them? No, you have to create the space. It won't happen by magic. Hmm. And Nigeria is not doing well in that regard, unfortunately. Okay, so Prof, um, for you, how do you think that women can get um, better uh, placed, especially with regards to these uh, legislative um, uh, positions? So the first point to start, the first takeoff point is education. The bill that failed in the Ninth Assembly failed largely because even the members who were supposed to vote didn't understand, first, why that bill was important. Second, that when you empower women politically and economically, it doesn't mean that the men are losing. It's not a question of we versus them. Every empowered woman politically and economically, is an asset to the family, it's an asset to the community, it's an asset to the nation. But it takes a lot of education to change the mindset of the people. And the prejudice, the beliefs that people have that when a woman is holding public office is not a good woman, we need to correct that impression because it's a false narrative. It has no basis. Okay, Prof, you mentioned something that um, um, you know really hit me. Um, and that's the aspect of education, not just of the populace now, but of the legislators themselves. A lot of the times what you have are politicians um, who have campaigned world level and all of that, and eventually they know that there is this space in the Federal House of Representatives and they want to go to Abuja, they're able to make it to Abuja, and they become legislators. But then bills come out that they are supposed to be able to look at judiciously, assent to, and grant express passage. But because they are not properly educated, they are unable to even defend the bill where they need to be. What do we do? How do we move forward? And it's going to be like a four-part question, because there is the part of what do we do, there is a part of how do we move forward, there is a part of experience in the legislature and what it counts for, right? Um, in the general, in the generality of our of, of our national assembly and the, 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 the creating the proper place, right, for the making of laws and oversight functions and all of that. So I'm sure you'll unpack them step by step yeah. and question by question. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very uh, good question because talking about the way forward, where do we go from here? Yeah. First, the education of the, 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 the education of the legislature is actually the first thing. Because there is no uh, member of parliament that didn't ride on the back of massive women's support. When you watch the campaigns, when you watch the mobilization, nobody does it better than the women. They are the ones that you will see organizing campaigns, doing the dancing, the singing, and everything. There is no member that has been elected into the National Assembly that did not ride on the back of very strong support for women, from women. Hmm. Is that even possible for 360 and 109 senators? If we take the gender bill, for example, as a man, as a man, an average man suffers from gender blindness. It's a disease. A man is born into specific privileges that a girl child does not enjoy. But because you are a beneficiary of those privileges, you are not conscious of what the other side is experiencing, right from childhood. A girl is growing up. Why are you sitting there like that? Like that? You are a girl. When people are talking, keep quiet, you are a girl. Where did you go to? You cannot be like a... If a boy goes out to play and comes back at night, there will be nothing. If a girl goes out and comes back late, she'll be in trouble. So a girl child grows up being confused about what is even right and what is wrong. So they don't want to take risks. They don't express themselves. They don't want to be the one to come out. So unless men are able to realize that it is important to create an enabling environment for women to be able to express themselves and bring their potentials to the fore and contribute to the development of this nation, it will never happen. You can't treat men and women are different. And you must create special dispensation for women. This requires a lot of education to get over gender blindness, to be able to get to the point that you will know that the bills are supposed to be gender sensitive and gender responsive. 
you yourself as a lawmaker, there is a level that you have to reach before you realize that. Okay. So the same thing applies to all the other kinds of bills that require technical know-how. So unless there is a preliminary capacity building for legislators for them to understand where the bill is coming from, and for them for to each for now. each bill that is coming to the floor, you can't just read the bill and become an expert on that area overnight. So there is supposed to be some capacity building, some kind of education intervention that is automatic. It is not supposed to be demand driven. The moment you realize that a bill is going to be tabled on the floor of the house, first layer the committees that are in charge, then all the members will require a lot of education on that particular bill in order to guide them so that they can take an informed decision as to where How to pitch their tents. How do we make that happen? That sounds like a far, it sounds like something difficult in my opinion, right? How do we make that happen? So, there are institutions that have been established to do that. The National Institute for Legislative and Democratic Studies is one of those. National Assembly Service Commission is also supposed to be part of that. And some structures within the National Assembly itself, from the department as I do with that responsibility. First of all, getting that. So, um, the, <laughs> that's a very tricky question. Because when you ask people, they will show you a long list of capacity building interventions that they have done. But whether the interventions have produced the desired result is a different question. A lot of money is being spent to send people on training, to go to this. So I think it will start from the leadership of the National Assembly itself. And, and that's the why it's person. important who becomes the leader. And who becomes the, the leader. The, that's why it's important that the leaders are people who understand these things. Exactly. So that you, do, you are not just ticking the box. To say we have organized X number of training for legislators. We have organized X number of training for legislative aides and legislative staff. No. You want to move beyond the input and output. You are going to the specific outcomes and the impact that that outcome is producing. Because if the training program is not being reflected in the quality of bills and the quality of contributions that members are making to the bill and how they are guided by their informed choice in pitching their tent as to whether to vote for or against a particular bill. We have not achieved anything. And the democracy is still crawling. The democracy will be crawling. The quality of the, the content of democracy will be very, it will be faulty. One of the major um, responsibilities of our lawmakers is oversight functions. And this is supposed to include oversight functions of the MDAs. Right, uh, it appears that it's still a bit of a business as usual kind of thing instead of us having the proper oversight function to ensure that these people are doing what they ought to do when they ought to do it. You know, it, it seems that we're still crawling with that. How can we fine tune these processes, perhaps digitize it, you know, and then how can we push it in such a way that the oversight functions by the legislators are properly done? And of course, uh, Nigerians who are the beneficiaries of whatever should be done, you know, gain from this. Well, anybody who is familiar with the legislature in Nigeria and the National Assembly in particular will not disagree with the um, uh, statement that oversight is probably one of the weakest points of the legislature in Nigeria for many reasons. One is the issue of capacity and the issue of education that we are talking about. Imagine the number of new legislators that we have in this tenth assembly and people who are coming from different backgrounds. Some of them are teachers, some of them were civil servants, some of them were in business. They didn't know anything about the technicalities of conducting oversight. So you can't expect somebody to come into parliament to become an expert in the conduct of oversight overnight. The second thing is that when you look at the we oversight is conducted. It's like an audit. The committees are supposed to conduct an audit of MDAs, ministries, departments, and agencies. The average size of the committee staff, I'm not talking about the members, but the staff that they can rely on to supply them data, to do analysis, to do preliminary research before they go into the field for on-site uh, uh, verification probably more, not more than 20. 
And many of these staff are people who also do not have the technical know-how of conducting oversight. So if you're now conducting oversight with just 20 staff with limited skills and tools against a ministry who have departments of finance, who have hundreds of staff, and you have to run through hundreds of files to be able to get down to where you will uh, ask specific questions, you can see that's a very uphill task. So if oversight will become effective. There are specific things that need to be done with the National Assembly. One, first and foremost, is to uh, build the capacity of the legislators and the staff on how to conduct oversight. The second thing is to look for some kind of external support for the committees. For example, some committees used to hire consultants but the kind of consultant they used to hire are still people who still do not know much about it. So there is a lot of things that, for, if I may be very open about this, if the leadership of the National Assembly approaches the World Bank, for example, to say that this is our problem, we have not been conducting oversight, and because of the, the implication of conducting real oversight is that corruption is still high, mismanagement is very high, and you can't hold people accountable, to their responsibilities and the monies that are given to them. World Bank, we need a 10-year intervention to help us transform how oversight is conducted. The World Bank knows they have experiences around the world. They know the kind of people to bring, either from abroad, in conjunction from, with people from Beijing, to build mechanisms that can harness the opportunities that are out there to ensure that when a committee is conducting oversight. It is true oversight that they are conducting. Well, just before we go, I think this will be my last question, and that is a high turnover rate of the legislators in the House. Um, in Nigeria today, we have a very high turnover rate, which is not um, equal or same with the legislature of the democracy we are copying. In America, for example, you have a legislator who's been a legislator since 30, 35. He's there till about 80, you know, and he's just there. But here we have legislators who do one term, they're taken out, another one comes in, you know, and which one of these practices is best for democracy? So there are two sides to this issue. When people compare Nigeria with other countries where they have legislators that have stayed long in parliament, they forget that Nigeria is different. In Nigeria, we have different constituencies. Within constituencies, we have different units who also desire to be represented. A, an average member of house will have about two or three local governments on that. You don't expect one local government to dominate the seat for 30 years. Oh. No. So when people talk about uh, legislative experience, you want people to stay long in parliament, you forget that Nigerian context is not like the American context. We are divided into different units. And each unit is desirous. So even when you have legislative turnover, a legislative turnover is not necessarily a bad thing. It actually is a signal that the democratic process is lively mm. and it is rotating among different peoples and you have opportunities of bringing new ideas to the floor every election cycle. For me, if you have a turnover rate of 60 to 70 percent and you are able to retain about 30 percent of the members in the house, it's sufficient enough to in to induct new members into the ways of the parliament. But if we say that we have seat-type parliamentarians, mm -hmm. I don't think it sits well with our own cultural context. Mm -hmm. So That's even true. if we want to adopt the culture of the countries where they have long uh, legislative experience, it will not work in Nigeria mm -hmm. because each of the constituencies will struggle Professor Fatai Aramu, thank you so much for your time. You are a professor of governance institutions and development studies. And if there is anybody that should be in any of the national assemblies, I guess you should be one of them. <laughs> are we looking at you contesting sometime soon? Well, let's hope so. We don't know what will happen. So let's see are what happens. Are you actively looking at contesting? 
Well, we can't rule anything out in 2027. <laughs> I mean, I, yes, I mean, yeah. and that's our package on building Thank the nation. Much. Thank you, Prof. Uh, that's our package on building the nation today. Uh, we have looked at the legislature and what they will be bringing to the table and how their support or opposition will affect the incoming government. I have been speaking with Professor Fatai Aremu, who is a professor of governance institutions and development um, studies. He is a multi author of several books on politics and government is also a resource person with regards to legislative affairs and politics in Nigeria and across the world. My name is Kemi Ashiko. It's been a pleasure bringing you this episode of Building the Nation. We'll be back again with you next time. Please stay with us. I'm <laughs> sorry.